Welcome to Exceptional Leadership. I'm your host, Anita Brooks. Though my focus is primarily pointed to leadership at an organizational level, let me assure you, most of what I share will translate to almost any aspect of life. Just tweak the info to fit your leadership role. Because whether you approach my content as a corporate leader, middle manager, small business owner, entrepreneur, or as a family member or friend, you are influencing someone. The question is, are you influencing well, exceptionally well? So let's take courage, exercise wisdom, and humbly invest in the people we are called to influence. Join me on a quest, not for perfection, but absolutely for exceptional leadership. Well, listeners, today we're going to discuss a topic that is very near and dear to my heart, and it's important for you. So I really urge you to listen closely to this conversation that I'm going to have, because what we do with our bodies and our minds and our spirits today is going to impact our abilities to do anything tomorrow or beyond that. And if we don't take good care of ourselves, we're not going to have that ability to be able to take care of others. And we're in, when we're in leadership, that's the most important role we have. So I am thrilled to invite Scarlett Barron today to the program. Scarlett's going to tell us a little bit about what she does, about her business. But as she's talking, just pick up on how she's influencing exceptionally well. Scarlett may not describe herself as a leader, but I know factually that she is. And maybe you can identify a little bit of that. So Scarlett, welcome to Exceptional Leadership. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. That is awesome. So tell us what the name of your business is and what you do. So I own Stay Fit Personal Training and what it is, it's one-on-one, um, you know, physical fitness coaching. And we also do small group uh, classes where we have about about eight people come in and it's usually friends, a group of friends that come in and uh, we show them how to work out uh, effectively and safely. And I love every minute of it. I love what I do. I know you do. And that is so fantastic. We, as leaders, we have to take care of our bodies, don't we? Yes, absolutely. And I know so many that don't do that. And I've seen the impact, the consequences when people don't exercise self care, when, mm -hmm. you know, they think that maybe that's something that is either unnecessary or maybe frivolous, and I have more important things to do. But in fact, there's nothing more important than taking care of our bodies, because eventually they'll give out if we don't. Right. A lot of excuses I hear is um, costs or time. And really, it, I just say, well, you're maybe spending money now, investing in your body now, which will actually save you money down the road because 20 years from now, when you're on 15 different medications or you have a heart attack and you have to go to the doctor every month now, which, which is going to be cheaper in the long run. So people have to change their mindset from it's just something they know they should do to actually doing it to invest in themselves and invest in their future so they can continue to do what they love, you know, longer than what they think than what the average person normally does. That is so true. And as I'm listening to you say that, it makes me think of our vehicles. So we know the importance of regular maintenance for our vehicles, especially oil changes. But I know that if you do not get your oil changed on a frequent enough basis, you run the risk of blowing the motor up. And then you're not going anywhere. You're done. And so I think it's the same way with our bodies. If we don't have regular maintenance on our bodies, which may cost us a little bit as we're going, we ha may have a much higher cost or expense down the road because our bodies are going to blow up on us. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. 
a little bit crazy maybe, but that's the way I look at it. <laughs> it's, it's very true. And it happens uh, faster than what usually people think it will. So <laughs> that is a fact. So many things in life happen faster than what we realize. You know, we'll tell mm -hmm. ourselves that emotional lie that, oh, well, I can do it tomorrow or next week or next month. But in fact, those days and weeks and months run out on us and they run out much more quickly than any of us would ever predict. So we can get ourselves in trouble with that kind of thinking. Yes. Yes. So let me ask you, I, I know that you work with some community leaders on occasion and people who are <laughs> leaders in the workplace. What are some common issues that you see from that harried and hurried leader that comes to you and says, oh, Scarlett, I have gotten so out of shape. Can you help me? You know, it depends on their outlook on life. I have some clients that they work seven days a week and it doesn't have the same effect on them as it would other clients that are just as important. They have very important careers and, and you know, positions in, in their job, but their mindset is different. So for example, I have a client, she is 69 and she works 70 hours a week. She comes to me twice a week. She walks three miles every day and then she plays tennis a little bit throughout the winter, but at least two or three times a week, spring, summer, fall. And so I look at her and then I look at someone else that just has your typical eight to five job and they say they don't have the time and it's all on how they look at it it's all about your your perspective and what you deem is important and you know for my client that is 69 she feels that her health is extremely important to her so she can continue to perform as her co-workers need her to so she can deliver you know so they can continue to to work well underneath her. They're all great leaders. They're all great people, but it is a lot on their mentality and how important they put their health and, and their list of priorities. That is such a great point. And you're right. It might, it starts with mindset, what happens in our bodies and in our performance. And I think about the description that you're giving the 69 year old. And I know I, I right now I have leaders that I'm working with that are in their forties, early forties at that. And I can assure you that they don't have the same energy that you're describing from the 69 year old. So one of the great benefits that we get if we are intentional with our physical health is it increases our energy and we're actually able to accomplish more. So where we may tell ourselves, well, I don't have time for that. In fact, when we exercise, when we work out, and that's a regular regimen for us, it helps us actually be able to do more. It's almost like we find time. It's kind of weird that way. You do find, yes, you do find time and your, your mind is able to process things quicker and better and you're able to understand things better whereas if you're to work 10 hours straight through you know your brain feels like mush when you're when you're done you really can't think as sharply as you would if had you just taken an hour off you would feel so much better and be able to get a lot more work done than if you just work straight through no break and that that's a big issue with our american society we're taught to work work, 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 and there's no break ever in between. Exactly. And I love what you said about just taking an hour break. It's almost like it, it it's gives us a fresh day when we come back. I know that's the way it is for me. I do a mm -hmm. lot of very intense, creative work a lot of times. And so I will try to take like lunchtime exercise breaks. And what I find is the days that I don't do it, I call it sledging through mud. That's what it feels like the whole rest of the day. But when I take that break and I go for a walk or a run, or I do a little bit of weightlifting or something, but especially if I get outdoors in the fresh air or I join with a group, there's also something about that social interaction. 
But that hour of exercise is like it lights me up and it refreshes me. And I am so much more productive in that second half of my day. So I love Mm -hmm. that. Well, I want to talk about uh, one particular area. So if anyone has listened back to my episodes where I talked about the personality training that I do, I mentioned the five areas that I've identified that if we are in that state, it will drive us to the weakest nature of our personalities. You know, all personality types have strengths and weaknesses. But in when we're in these states, and I'm going to list these five in just a minute, and, and I want to talk about each one of them with you, Scarlett, but it will make us if we're if we tend to be more of an introvert, we'll draw more into ourselves and be less willing to interact with other people. If we are strongly extroverted, we may bark at people and we be may be even louder and more vocal with others. So those are just examples. But let's talk about these five areas because I think all of those directly connect with the work that you do in fitness and helping people have more strength and energy and endurance to do the things that they want to do. So is that okay with you, Scarlett? Yep. Sounds great. Awesome. Okay. So the first one is fatigue and fatigue is one of those things. It doesn't take much. Like you can have one night where you do not get either enough hours of sleep or you don't get a truly restful night's sleep. And the impact on that is that, again, it makes us not operate out of our strengths, but out of our weaknesses, which makes us very ineffective as leaders. We're certainly not exceptional leaders in that state. So what are your thoughts about fatigue or even some of your background and education on what fatigue does to us as human beings? Well, I do have a lot of clients that deal with um, mostly the, the sleep, um, really since COVID and, and, you know, after COVID clients, I've noticed their sleep, it never really seemed to get back to normal, whether it was because, um, they were stressed from losing their jobs or possibly losing their jobs, or, um, they were a nurse and they had to work 12 hour days, six to seven days a week. Cause no one was available to work, you know? So the fatigue part, I've really had to deal with more so in the past that year and a half. And a lot of that can be caused simply by someone's diet. I have a lot of clients that, you know, they'll just eat once a day and they, they don't understand, you know, why am I not losing weight? Why, why don't I feel better? And, you know, the, the list goes on and, you know, your body is ultimately it's, it's starving, you know, it doesn't know when its next meal is going to, to come. So whenever it reads that I'm not getting food, so I'm going to shut down and try to save as much energy as possible. So, you know, all day long, our bodies are basically sleeping and then we eat this food right before we go to bed or, you know, two or three hours before we go to bed and then our body wakes up again and all night our body is trying to digest this food, but we're really actually trying to sleep. And so our body's working and it's not getting the rest that it should be getting had we, you know, been eating in regular intervals and trying to take better care of ourselves like we should. So that is a big part of it, believe it or not, is is simply just someone's diet. And then also as far as on the physical side of it, yes, they work all day, but it is not a, it is, it is mostly work that they can do, you know, on, on automatic, you know, they don't really have to put a lot of thought into it. You know, it's just they work through it automatically day in and day out. Whereas when they add some physical fitness into it, you have to think of what you're doing. You have to think of what muscles are you engaging. If, you know, I'm having you do some plyometric movements, you're jumping, your body is changing levels. So it, it makes our brains work in a different way. And actually, yes, it gives us more energy, but it will actually help us sleep better and to recover better 
um, than if we just don't exercise at all. So that that's my big thing is trying to eat better, but also add in that physical aspect of it to really try to get over that fatigue and get our bodies working on a normal cycle like they're designed to. Those are really good points, Scarlett. Uh, one, I'm, I'm going to start with what you ended on the physical. I, I know for myself, when I'm exercising, I actually, it, it's like I require less rest. If I'm not exercising, I could get 10 hours of sleep and still wake up groggy and almost feel like I'm drugged or something. Mm -hmm. But when I exercise, there's a brain chemistry change in me to where not only do I not feel like I need so many hours, but I wake up sharper, more, more mentally alert and more energized and ready to start my day. So there's definitely uh, some kind of chemical release that happens when we physically work out that positively impacts our rest as well. Yes. But on the food side, you really hit on something that a lot <laughs> of people in leadership struggle with because they don't only carry their challenges, their issues, their problems. But so often they are expected to carry the challenges, issues, and problems of other people as well. And so because of that, many times they don't have time to eat or they don't take time or schedule time to eat. Mm -hmm. And so they'll go, like you said, all day long and not eat anything at all. But you know, and I've studied intermittent fasting. I, I actually do intermittent fasting. So there, there are times when I will be that person that you described. I only eat one meal a day, but it's what I eat when I open that window or mm -hmm. this person who's maybe carrying all of this weight all throughout the day. And so they just have not taken time to eat. When they do eat too often, they're filling themselves with junk food. They, they go yeah. to that, that comfort food, if you will. But it's not healthy. It's not nutritious. It's not fueling and feeding our brains and our organs and our bodies so that when we lay down, we can sleep. And junk food doesn't digest well. So where something that's healthy and nutritious, oftentimes our bodies will digest that prior to us going to sleep. If we eat junk, our body's trying to process something that, frankly, it was never made to take in anyway, and it can spend all night working itself cr like crazy. And then we wake up the next morning and wonder why we feel so bad. Yeah, that's exactly what happens. Yes. Yeah. And I just, I know that I've been guilty of the junk food crunch hour, <laughs> but oh, sure. what I've learned from that is that it's not worth it. No matter how much I, and, and you know, I, I'm a stress eater. So when I'm stressed, I will crave the very worst things that I need. But what I really have learned to do is to ask myself, and look, you can judge me. I'm going to give everybody permission to judge me for what I'm getting ready to say. But this is one of those areas that for me, it is intentional self-talk and it works for me. It's a way of holding myself accountable. So if you don't like it, find your own way to say something. But I'm just telling you this works for me. But I'll just say to myself, do you want to be fit or fat? Because it's your <laughs> choice, right? So whatever you're putting into your body right now is going to either help you become more fit or become fatter. And so when I do that, it does make me stop and think, and I'm not so prone to throw in the junk from the stress or from that long work day that I've had. And I'm not 100% perfect at that. But I'll tell you what, I'm a whole lot better than I used to be. And I sleep a much better today, too. Yes. And you know, a lot of people are stress eaters. And so I just tell them we have to find what works for you to cope with that stress. That is not food related. So yours is a mantra, which I find rather funny. It sounds like something <laughs> To myself, you don't need that. Um, but, you know, finding other outlets that people can release that stress rather than food is something I focus on with my clients as well, because it, it is, it's everywhere. The stress eating is, is real, especially since COVID. It is. And I've said before, 
I am absolutely convinced, and it's an ongoing work that I'm doing right now where I'm working on something I call post-pandemic stress disorder, because I believe we absolutely are in that. So um, I appreciate the fact that you bring that up because I've seen the same thing. It affects sleep <laughs> patterns. It affects eating habits. It affects the the cognitive ability of people to even be able to perform and be productive in the workplace. And so I love the fact that you are focusing on helping people find other ways besides stress eating. So let me ask you, are there any, you know, maybe a couple of tips that you might give our listeners on ways, alternative ways that they can break stress besides just throwing that junk food in their mouths? Yes. And again, it goes, it goes back to what is causing them stress. Um, a lot of times, and I've heard you talk about this as well. Um, what we fear, what is it? 97% of the time never happens. Yes. So, um, a lot of this stress that I find people bringing on themselves, it's not actually real or it's really not their problem to worry about. Um, so, you know, most of my clients, they're working with coworkers, I don't, none of them work, you know, just for themselves, but so they have coworkers and, you know, it's usually a coworker that they don't believe they're doing their job good enough or they're doing this and doing that, you know, and it's not, and at first I, I w- would just let my client vent and, and I will let, let him or her vent because that's really what they need me for. And once they're finished, you know, if they're, If they're looking for an opinion, I'll give it to them. If they're looking just to rant, I won't say a word. Mm -hmm. But I'll ask, are you asking for my opinion? Mm -hmm. And if they say yes, then I'll say, it's not your problem. So if they're taking on stress that is not necessary, we talk about how to mentally deal with that. At that moment, when that coworker starts doing whatever it is that normally sets them off, whether it's kind of turning that out, taking a few deep breaths, leaving the the room, the situation, if they're able to, to try to remove themselves from that stressful situation. And if they're able to do that, we practice doing that. And normally that's all it takes is just for them to get away from that person whenever they start doing whatever it is that caused them stress. If it's a family issue or, you know, things that is bigger than just a job, you know, it's, it's their life. Um, I tell them, you know, take a, a walk without your phone, without anybody around, just go take a 10 minute walk, try to enjoy the sounds of nature, the wind blowing, you know, the smells. I mean, at, we spend our days in on screens. If it's not in front of our face, we don't see it. Mm. Nature is beautiful and and it is wonderful to help reduce your stress. So the number one thing I tell my clients is go for a walk, go for a 10 minute walk. And if they still are craving food or whatever it is they want, then fine, have a bite of the chocolate or have a serving of the chips. Don't just grab the whole bag out of the pantry and sit <laughs> on the couch with, it. you know, so it's it's very simple things. But our society has made diet culture so confusing on purpose so they can make lots of money off of you uh, that people, you know, they they can't think they don't think that simple fixes is the answer. They think it's some kind of pill or some kind of crazy exercise regimen or right now, 75 day hard is really popular. Mm -hmm. Um, And it it doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be anything special. Just simply going outside and taking a walk 90% of the time is, is all it takes. And I love everything you just said, Scarlett, because it is the simple so often that's the most powerful. Mm-hmm. And, and you were describing something people too often, and we've all been guilty of it, but we take on other people's stress, or we let something or someone trigger us inappropriately. Sometimes we even build it up in our minds and get vain imaginations and start 
assuming and believing all manner of things that aren't even true. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that I use is I call it my facts versus feelings exercise. And um, I actually, my digital course, Fast Track Leadership Impacted, this is one of those tools and resources I use in this. But it's simply on one side, listing all the verifiable evidence that supports the what you're thinking or feeling. But on the other side, the feeling side, what are all the emotions that you have and why? Are you feeling that way? There's something about putting it in a visual that helps give us, gives us clarity and brings us closer to the real truth. So that's a a helpful thing. But something else you said, we will often do what I call carrying somebody else's monkey on our backs. Now we all have monkeys and some of them are our monkeys to carry, but too often we're putting other people's monkeys or we're allowing them to throw their monkeys on our backs, especially as leaders, when that's inappropriate and it's unnecessary. But when we do that, it impacts our health in a very negative way. And so we do need to pay attention to that and we do need to guard ourselves against it. And then lastly, lastly, what you just said there about just taking the walk, especially if we can get out of nature. God created nature to be a healing force, and it is. But too often, we're paying closer attention to what's on our phone screen, and we're not listening to the birds sing. As you said, we're not feeling the breeze brush our faces. We're missing out on all of those healing qualities where if we would connect and plug into that, then it could totally transform our days. And so much of that stress could just almost be washed away at that point. So I love that. So let's talk about the next one, Scarlett, and that is hunger. And we've touched on that a little bit, so we probably won't need to delve in this too deeply. But I'm not talking about the hunger that like maybe we're just an hour past mealtime. But the type that will drive you to the weakest part of your personality is the one that like you're having physical symptoms. You maybe have a headache, you're feeling a little weak, your stomach's grumbling. And that can cause us to behave in ways that we know are not really effective, but it's almost like we struggle to do anything about that. So what are your thoughts on hunger that anything that maybe we haven't discussed already? Um, I would say people that, oh, I they realize it's three or four hours past their mealtime and they are hangry. They're not hungry anymore. They're hangry, which is what you just described. It starts hitting us uh, at a emotional and deeper level um, than just hunger. And it's simple. Um, You know, it's very simple, especially now with all the snacks and stuff that Walmart sells or Aldi or Schnucks or wherever you, you go. There's a ton of options that you can just keep a little bag of almonds or some dried fruit or... Um, you know, whatever it is, you can keep a little baggie of those in your briefcase or your purse or computer case, you know, whatever it is you're carrying around with you every day. It's so simple to buy a box of whatever snacks you enjoy and keep one in your bag every day. People at church make fun of me because I would get hungry during church and then I would overeat at lunch. Every every Sunday, I would overeat. Mm. So I just started packing a protein bar in my purse. And I eat that slowly throughout the sermon. And people make fun of me. And that's okay, because I'm the one that's not hungry. And they are. <laughs> so it, it's very simple things. But like I said, we just, we overcomplicate it. You're so right. And, <laughs> and first off, making sure that we eat the things that nature created, Those are the healthiest things for us. Mm -hmm. So the nuts or the fruit or maybe some veggies. And if we just take a little bit of time and and it doesn't take long, I know I I literally, I am one of the busiest people I know. And if I can do it, I can assure you, you can do it. Mm -hmm. But just taking a few minutes every week and taking some of those little snack baggies and and putting some celery sticks or carrot sticks or almonds or walnuts Whatever it is that's going to be a healthy snack for you that's going to get you through so you don't overeat, that's massive. Or that you don't go too long without eating so that then you are having all of those physical symptoms. And 
with that, there's something that I learned a little while back. And so I'm just going to segue us right into the third uh, area that drives us to our weakest nature. I figured out that a lot of times I was misinterpreting dehydration as hunger. Mm -hmm. So I was really thirsty, but my brain was telling me for whatever reason I was hungry. And so I was overeating and I was under hydrating. But now I figured that out. And so when I hydrate, I find again that I'm more mentally sharp. My energy is higher. I have fewer headaches and I feel less hungry. Yes. Yes. I try to get my clients to drink. I drink a gallon a day. Mm-hmm. Um, and yes, the downside of that is always having to use the restroom, mm-hmm. but otherwise I do feel dehydrated and I am more hungry. So yes, drinking your water is a huge, simple thing we can do to help us feel better every day and, and to look better on the outside as well. Yes. And it does, and it affects our mental acuity, our ability to be able to get things done faster and more accurately. It energizes us and it also flushes toxins out of us. So yes. many times we have a toxic buildup and we don't even realize that that's there. But if we don't drink adequate water, then it just continues to build instead of us getting that cleaned out. And so I know for me, I drink a gallon of water every day too. And especially in the beginning, when you start doing it, you really have to use the restroom a lot. (laughs) But it does get more balanced. But the benefits of it are so worth it. And once you do it, I mean, it's almost addicting how much better you feel just by hydrating. Yes, it is. And again, it's one of those simple but powerful things that in leadership, we miss it. And you know, I don't know of any leader in any position that cannot find a way to have water nearby. And so if you will become again intentional to do that, whether it's bringing a a gallon container of water with you to work, listen, I carry one wherever I go. And I've had people make fun of me for that. But you know what? I don't care because I feel better. I look better. My skin is clearer, but I certainly think better. And so you make fun of me, if you will, but my gallon of water is always going to be close at hand. My family doesn't question anymore what I bring with me. They don't question it. They're just, they're used to it by now. So (laughs) exactly. People do. (laughs) Yeah. Let people make fun of you. Jokes on them. You're the one that's being uh, healthy and taking care of yourself. So, (laughs) well, and I don't know about you, Scarlett, but I've had this and you talk about a leadership quality. I've had a situation like that where I've started out doing something that someone made fun of me for. But after a little while, not only did they stop making fun of me, but they actually started doing it themselves. So sometimes we're leading people when we push past that and we don't allow what other people will maybe say to stop us from doing what we know is good for us. And then by doing that, we exemplify, we model for them something that maybe will make their lives better too. It's a courageous act, but it's one that's worth following. Yes, it is. So let's talk about number four. So the fourth thing that I've identified that will drive us to our weakest personality uh, state is illness. So being sick And it can be anything from uh, a common cold or you brought up COVID earlier. We're still seeing the impacts of, again, what I call post-pandemic stress disorder. And so what have you seen as far as the impact of illness and physical exercise, its impact on illness itself? So I will say there is a thin line. Um, where, you know, clients that they are diehard clients, they do not miss for anything. And I have some that will come in and you can just look at them and be like, they're not working out today. They don't feel good. And, you know, I'll ask them, how are you feeling? Well, I'm sick or cough, cold, you know, whatever it is, but they're there to work out. And 
I kind of have to be careful with how I, I word things, but I never want a client to feel like I don't want them there. Because I, I do. I, I want you there. I'm glad they showed up. But there is a time when you can push through and do the workout and actually feel better than when you started. Because of that hormone release, it does actually help us uh, recover from sickness faster. But I've learned you have to be kind of on the tail end of that. So if you're getting a cold and you show up, we can work out, you know, and see how you feel the next day. If you are sick, this is your time to rest. There is always a time to be active, but there's always a time to let your body rest as well. And I have a lot of times that they, myself as well, I struggle with when to rest. I always want to be going and I always feel like, oh, I need to do this. I need to do that. I can push through this fatigue or I can push through this cold or you know, whatever it is I'm feeling. But there is a time when our bodies sometimes have to scream at us to lay down and rest. You know, so there, there's a fine line there. Like I said, someone is getting over a cold or cough or whatever it is, will exercise at a lower level and they typically leave feeling better. But there is that time where it's, you got to, you have to put the brakes on and you have to let your body rest. That is so good. One of the things that I've learned, Scarlett, is to be balanced in my, mm-hmm. my working out. So I had COVID. And when I had it, obviously, I didn't feel good. But one of the things that I believe helped me to not get it maybe as deeply as some, certainly not to have it last longer and not to have some of the long term effects was I I did all the things for my body. So when I ate, I made sure it was nutritious food. I kept myself very well hydrated. I rested a lot. But once every hour, I got up and I would run in place for 60 seconds. Now, it was very short term. But what mm-hmm. it did is it got my blood working. And I feel like it helped to boost my immune system. And so, but I didn't do it very long, 60 seconds. That was all I did. And believe me, I mean, I was weaker than normal. So 60 seconds may not sound like much, but it felt like a lot, but it was still enough that I could tell it made a difference. So like, what are your thoughts about that? Like doing, if you're sick, whether you go anywhere, you're just at home, being able to do like some kind of very short term, short burst to get that blood flow moving. It is good to do that. Because like you said, it does get your blood flow going. It gets, so your, your blood is what carries nutrients to the areas that need healing. So even if a client, if we strain our low back or you hurt our knee or or whatever it is that you injure, doing light stretches, yes, it hurts, but that signals to our brain, there's pain here, there's something wrong. And it sends blood to that area with the nutrients our bodies need to heal whatever is wrong. And it's the same thing with illness, you know, whatever virus our our body has. um, When you get your heart rate going and your blood pumping, it's sending nutrients throughout your body to help fight that sickness. It obviously it does that when we're sitting as well and sleeping. Um, But getting that heart rate up does help with the healing process faster. And like you said, with eating good food, sometimes we don't feel like eating when when we're sick. I I understand that. Um, But when you do eat, you know, it's not Pop-Tarts and cereal or, you know, whatever it is. Although I am guilty. I was sick last winter and strawberry Pop-Tarts was the only thing that sounded good. So I went for it. (laughs) <laughs> but I did also have, you know, my protein in there at, throughout the day as well. But eating the food that is going to give us nutrients is very, very important. You can't go two or three days eating chicken broth and expect to, to 
to get better as quickly as possible. So kind of have to shut off uh, what you're feeling and get your brain working and think, what do I need versus what do I feel? That is a great point. When I had COVID, I lost my taste and smell like so many people. And when you can't taste or smell something, you really don't feel like Mm -hmm. eating. But I forced myself to eat nutritious food anyway. Of course, I ate less of it. Wasn't necessarily an all bad thing, but I, I did make myself do it because I, exactly what you just said. I didn't go on how I felt. I went on what I knew I needed. And sometimes we let our emotions drive our decisions instead of making data driven decisions. And those yeah. data driven decisions are the ones that can help get us where we need to be, especially mm-hmm. in leadership. So yes. And it's always the, it seems to always be the harder. Uh, ones that are the right decisions to make, doesn't it? <laughs> exactly. I don't know why that is about human nature. That's so no. true. Yeah. And I love what you said too about when we get our blood moving, it sends the, the healing hormones and nutrients to the places that need healing. So I, I think that's fantastic. I never thought of it that way, but I'm definitely going to keep that in mind. So good stuff. Okay, so the last number five of the areas that will drive us to our weakest nature is pressure cooker stress. Now, I'm not talking about regular stress. I'm running, you know, a little bit late or or that type of thing. But I'm talking about like maybe that kind of stress so many leaders have, like they have a, a deadline that they have to meet. And maybe it's a government agency that that is waiting on something or the biggest client that they have or something like that. But there's a myriad of things that can just make us feel almost as if we can't breathe. There's so much stress. So what impact does that have on our bodies? And do you have any tips for us as far as is there anything, those simple little things that we can do when the, the pressure is that strong? Yes. And I can speak from a personal experience because I dealt with that when I was in college. I went to the doctor thinking something was wrong with me because I couldn't breathe. I couldn't sleep. You know, something's wrong. Something's wrong. So I went to the doctor and they did an x-ray and, you know, all this stuff. And they're like, yeah, it's stress. I'm like, it's not stress. That's not what's wrong with me. He goes, yeah, it's stress. You just need to not think about it. And now it's his advice. And I'm thinking, great. Okay. I just won't think about it. I, I still have sometimes if I'm not careful when I am overworking, I'm not sleeping enough. I'm trying to get my exercise in and taking care of just my daily life plus my business. I will start to feel that way, that short of breath, just sitting. I can't catch my breath. So what I learned to do, and uh, I am a very strong believing Christian. I try to live that out in my daily life. And what I started doing was I get up two hours and I understand not everyone can do this, but this is what works for me. I get up two hours before my first client. Um, Normally, that's anywhere between 4 and 5 a.m. It's quiet. The world has not woken up yet. No one is texting me. I don't have to worry about interruptions. I'll get up, pour myself some coffee, and I'll read my Bible Mm -hmm. anywhere from 30 to sometimes 45 minutes now, if I have the time. Taking that time out for myself just that 30 to 45 minutes every morning, that is all I need. And it has really changed my life and how I look at my business. It's so easy to think my that what I do is who I am. Mm-hmm. And it's not. That's not my, that's not what gives me worth. That's not my self-worth. That's one thing I would say is, you know, reading your Bible or just sitting in silence for five to 10 minutes is something that I I would recommend to people trying to find someone that you can depend on to confide in so that you can kind of not unload, but maybe just share what you're feeling with them and 
maybe that person has advice to you, but maybe you just need a, a good ear to, to hear what you're saying, to understand what you're feeling. So that's what's really helped with me. And also when I start to feel that way, I think, okay, I've taken on too much at work. What can I do to get rid of some of this weight that I'm feeling? And typically it's things that I've put on myself, I've caused this own situation on my own. Now I have to get myself out of it. Once you learn that you are putting too much on your plate, because that situation probably is going to come up again where someone's going to ask you to do something and you know you don't have the time to do it, but you say yes anyway. Don't make the same mistake again. Say no. Those people will figure out someone else to take care of it or they'll take care of it themselves or, you know, this. it's not up to us to fix everything and to say yes to everything that people ask us to do. And that's something I am still learning and still struggle with because, you know, clients are always wanting to reschedule or add another session or whatever it is. And I finally set a boundary this year that I don't work Tuesdays. I work Monday through Saturday, except for Sunday and Tuesday. I have clients ask me all the time if they can come in on Tuesday. And every time I struggle, but I, I'm like, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing that. That is my one day for me to get s- stuff done. Otherwise, if I work on Tuesday, I'm sh- so stressed the rest of the week, I can't hardly sleep. Mm-hmm. So setting those boundaries is so important. And sticking to them is even harder than it is to set them, in my opinion. So that that's what I'm trying to, to do in my, as I get older, be smarter and wiser with my time and, and learning to say no. <laughs> well, I, I love everything you just shared. And so in our last couple minutes, I'll, I'll just kind of camp on to what you said. One, if our spiritual life is out of order, it, it it's so strange how that seems to magnify stress and mm-hmm. problems and issues. But like you, I find it soothing and relaxing and enlightening to read the Bible. And when I spend time there, not only do I sometimes find answers to something I'm struggling with, but it just makes me feel calmer. And I know that I'm not alone as I read that. And it's just such a beautiful thing. I wish everyone was willing to experience that. Yes. And you just brought up the thing about boundaries. And so I want to add to that, keeping promises. If you are telling someone, this is my boundary, then you need to keep that promise to yourself. Talking about the Bible, Ecclesiastes 5.5 says this, it's better not to make a vow than to make one and break it. I read that many years ago, and I resolved to become a promise keeper. And I'm a very, very good promise keeper. But a few years ago, I realized I was very good, except for in one area. I constantly broke promises to myself. And whether you use the promise or vow or not, if you tell someone, including yourself, that you're going to do something, then there should be a reasonable exp- or expectation that you're going to do it. You're going to follow through. You're going to keep your word. And I was breaking my word because I kept letting people cross those boundaries. Mm-hmm. But like you, I am much, much better now. And it is still difficult sometimes. Sometimes my heart aches. I want to say yes, but I know it's not the right thing to do. And I need to do the hard right thing. And then the last thing I'll say that I think it just goes right along with everything you shared is the importance of giving ourselves mental breaks and emotional escape. This is going to be in my fast track leadership impact course, my management certification course, because I think it's so crucial. And so many leaders don't practice this, but that is taking a at least one day a week Sabbath break where you do not 
email. You don't text about work. You don't think about work. You don't do work. But you literally give yourself a full 24 hours where there is a mental break and emotional escape from what you do the other five or six days a week. It is life changing. It's transformative and it frees you up to do a much better job when you are working. So listener, if you are that type A overworked person, hear me say this. Try it. It's not going to feel comfortable at first. You know, you brought up sitting in silence, Scarlett. I remember the first time I did that and I thought, I can't do this is hard. I can't. No, I've got to have some noise. I got to have white noise. You know what? No, Mm -hmm. I don't. And I actually feel calmer, more at peace. I feel more balanced in my thinking. I make better decisions because I am willing to take those moments and sit in silence. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I may be having a conversation with God. Sometimes I might just be sitting there and listening to the birds sing. But that sitting in silence brings a healing and it helps me work not in my weaknesses, but in my strengths. Yes, I agree with that completely. Yes. Well, Scarlett, thank you so much for joining us today. You have shared a ton of wisdom. I love the fact that in your business, you teach balance. You don't talk about like fad diets or anything like that. As a matter of fact, you talk against those things because they'll get us in trouble. But you really are focused on the things that are long lasting and that they will have impact, not just today, but for many years to come. So thank you very much for the work that you do and for being an exceptional leader. Well, thank you so much for having me on. And I I very much enjoyed it. Awesome. That is wonderful. Well, listener for you, I just want to remind you that you have a choice every day. You're going to lead someone, but are you going to do it exceptionally well? And remember, if you've gotten something beneficial from this podcast, share it with someone else. Let them know that we are here. We're not getting anything out of this. We're just here to serve you. And if anyone wants to know any more about me, you can go to my website, anitabrooks.com. But I want you to know that it's part of my mission in life to help leaders not only lead exceptionally well, but to live exceptional lives. So please, I urge you, make that choice for yourself today and take care of you. Thanks for joining me for this episode of the Exceptional Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Anita Brooks. And I just want to remind you of a truth. If you are not leading at the level that you want to be at, remember, it is never too late for a fresh start with fresh faith. You can start today. You can start making a difference. You can help the world become a better place. You can begin to lead with intent, your family, your friends, the people you work with, your community, in your church, in our nation, across the planet. Whatever opportunities come your way, remember that did not happen by accident. And by stepping up and leading exceptionally well, you will help fulfill the purpose you were created for.